Let's now turn to our CDT and Pandemic Warrior series. Here are anchors Lindy Mtangana and Raman Yang with the la la latest installment on the key individuals who kept the society running when people remained in lockdown. Unsure and a little unsteady. The African continent threw everything it had at the coronavirus pandemic, even as it monitored and participated in efforts to find solutions. Every corner of the continent called for more medicine, more equipment, more personnel. Well, today we shine our cameras at some of the places where this help came from, the lifeblood of the battle. I'm Lindy Tongana. And I am Raman Yang. Indeed, Lindy, the fact of the matter is, as you very well put it, this has been and continues to be a monumental battle. It's a struggle to keep systems up and running and to help those who are at home now dealing with all these new realities that we have to be dealing with on a daily basis. Absolutely a true test for governments across the continent. Now a critical part of this war on COVID-19 has been the logistical struggle, keeping both people and crucial supplies moving while also fighting to stay safe from any infection. You know, Rama, it was a forced landing for many airlines as we saw international flights being grounded as well as regional flights too. And in fact, it's hard to imagine how the pilots felt along with cabin crew and technical workers. Indeed, it's often easy to forget that it's not just about pilots and cabin crew. There's an entire chain of personnel behind them as well. And for those who are used to flying regularly, this was basically their worst case scenario being completely grounded it almost feels like a bird whose wings have been completely broken but that being said not all flights were grounded the lifeline around the world remained cargo flights so were spiriting supplies from manufacturing giants to the rest of the world our pandemic warrior today is one of those people Meet Gordon Onyango. He's a cargo worker at D.B. Schenker in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. He's part of a dedicated team of people that ensured, despite everything that the pandemic threw at us, cargo kept moving. D.B. Schenker, one of the leading global logistics companies supporting industries with exchange of goods through land, wildwood freight and ocean. We visit their Kenya office and here we meet Gordon Onyango, one of the loading staff starting off his day. It's rather a tough season and the protocols here are strict. Temperature checks and hygiene are mandatory. He goes through the new normal compulsory checks. Heads to the safety room for his reflector, then he heads straight to the office for a handover brief from the night duty teams. He gets a short briefing from the air freight operations manager and heads straight to action. Today, most of the goods on transit to several destinations across the world have short shelf life. They are perishables and time is an essential aspect. Onyango and team have to beat time to make sure the goods get to the plane in good time. We are guided with what we call a booking sheet. In the booking sheet, we are, we are doing what we have for the day. Let's say we have a client who wants his, his, his commodities to be exported to Dubai. Now we are looking at which airline we have allocated for that booking and which volumes and which time they're supposed to be leaving from Nairobi. So that's where I locate my guys. I go through the booking, I communicate with the clients and let them know if they are still on with their bookings or if there's any cancellations or if there's only volume increase or volume decrease. During this time of pandemic, we have noticed that we have been having low volumes uh, most of the customers are, are not getting orders from abroad. Most of the customers are not getting orders from abroad, so we have low volume of bookings. So apparently we have been running at a level whereby you can see not above par, not below par. Gordon's work ethic has always been admirable. One of the consistent workers at the company was made a supervisor. And for him, it's all about servant leadership. Even through the hard time, he has been able to discharge his duties, making sure he plays a role in the supply chain across the world. His seniors have so much positives to say about him. As a person, he is a, a team player. He is a, a very motivated character and he is able to motivate his team as well. 
During this time, he has uh, he's, he's done an exemplary job because uh, even with the decline in volumes, we have had uh, also some staff working from home because of uh, the COVID restrictions. But he's still been able to mobilize his teams uh, and uh, see that uh, work is done within time. We are okay, but we are hoping that things will get better because as, as of now we are into the high season. And as you can, as you can see, most of the airlines are now operating. Uh, unlike the, during the first times of the pandemic where most of the airlines had closed and their rates were so high for our clients. So we couldn't even break the margins compared to the freight charges which the airlines were giving us. The workflow is well organized. Even as other goods are taken to the air side, other goods are still coming in from suppliers across Kenya for exports and for these workers filling in the gap during this difficult season. Indeed, these are unsung heroes who have made the world a better place from former cargo, food, flowers and many other commodities. The cargo workers have been able to put smiles in many people's faces across the world. They are indeed warriors armed with hope and a big heart to make the world a better place. A disturbing outcome of the coronavirus pandemic was the sharp rise in domestic and gender-based violence. It certainly called for another type of warrior, not those dealing with victims of the coronavirus, but rather victims of violence. Indeed, certainly a, a very negative outcome of this particular pandemic. This next story comes to you from South Africa. A veteran actor in that country, Patrick Shai, says it's time for men in South Africa to start seeing women and children as human beings deserving of safety and protection and to bring an end to gender-based violence altogether. Shai is a former perpetrator of violence against his partner, who became an activist nearly 10 years ago, when a TV drama scene that he was acting in depicted the kind of intimate partner violence he had committed for years against his wife. That was the day that the shame of his actions came crashing down and he decided to change his ways for good. Here's the GTN's Rene Del Calm with that story. It's been 10 years since actor Patrick Shai first spoke out publicly about beating up his wife, even though he'd hated seeing his stepdad abuse his mother. I beat her up for my own infidelities. I beat her up for my own insecurities. I would say, I want to beat you so hard that you scream, you cry louder than my mum. He used this public service announcement to stand up and admit to the pain he had caused. I wanted her to love me, but how can you say that someone loves you when they are afraid of you? Today, Patrick's main mission is to try and stop other men from perpetrating gender-based violence. He says he recently had to intervene in the lives of several violent, even suicidal men who claimed to have lost their self-worth as a result of the impact of COVID-19. The gravity of violence against women is so intense, it borders on hate crime. If you wake up every morning, then you hear of the woman's body lying naked in the field. She was raped, killed body incinerated. According to police crime figures, a woman is murdered in South Africa every three hours. At least 51% of women experience violence at the hands of their intimate partners. And the COVID-19 lockdown only made things worse, says research psychologist Neziswa Titi. For most families, lockdown meant loss of jobs, right? And loss of jobs means that that um, both parties will be at home and that means that there will be hunger in the home and when everybody is hungry they, they are more irritable and violence will, will then strike. And from the end of March to the end of April this year, the Children's Helpline Childline saw an increase of 400% in calls reporting the abuse of children. So that means then that children as well as women were in more danger at home than they were anywhere else. We live in a male-controlled, 
a male-dominated society where men feel entitled to women and women's bodies. And that speaks to patriarchy, where women are taught and are told that they, they must be subordinate to men. What Patrick calls his Damascus moment or turning point in his life came when he had to play the role of an abusive husband in a TV show. The actress who had played his victim in the scene suddenly reminded him of his own wife when she had pleaded with him to stop beating her. And I did not like the monster that was revealed to me. And I snapped out of it and I, I cried, cut, 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 cut and I walked off set. And I was, as I was walking off set, you know, the crew was saying, what a wonderful performance. And all I could say was, it couldn't be me. Meaning this person that I saw in that vision, it was not me. I did not like that person one bit. I hated that person. That's when I realized that I needed to change. It was not about what anybody else said. It was about me. And with me, it had to stop. It should not be women who should be in the forefront of men's violence against women and children. That's men's problem. It is a men's problem. And break the silence. Speak about your fears. Speak about your concerns. You are human. It is, it is okay for a man to be vulnerable. Uh, it, is not all, it is not necessary for you to affirm yourself physically, to want to be a patriarchal man, be a human being first. Rene Dalcom, CGTN, Cape Town, South Africa. Lindy, that is a pretty unfortunate burden that's been brought to bear on so many homes as lockdowns compelled couples to spend a lot more time together, but also in a very confined, limiting environment. And children too, that found themselves in the same home as potential abusers. Uh, so of course, putting many families uh, under pressure. And we're of course very happy to hear that in some cases, there were people that were there to help. Up next, voices from across the continent. <laughs> We really need to see good things in 2021 because 2020 has been a terrible year. There was a lot of crime in our city. Our government must stump it out next year. We don't want to see it again. The status and the situation during the time of the uh, pandemic are very terrible. And they are terrible in such a manner that there is a lot of crisis in the, the economy. This is for the poor and the rich. The heat is reaching everybody. And the good thing is that we have all pulled, uh, we've all joined together in this fight to make sure that we can all be able to come out of it successfully. So I'm very hopeful, I'm very, very hopeful that after maybe mid-2021, we'll start seeing some good numbers coming up. Well, as the year 2020 draws to a close, one of the key questions we're often asking ourselves is, what have we learned from this year? Well, on a lighter hearted note, I did see a meme in which somebody said, the one thing I've learned about myself in 2020 is that I have an average temperature of 36 degrees. Well, we've all been taking our temperatures this year. But that, that's the thing about this particular year. It's made us focus on a lot of things that we tend to ignore. I mean, I'm not sure if it's the same for a lot of our audience, but this is the first year in at least a decade that I can personally remember when I've not had a crazy flu bringing me down. And more often than not, it'd be like I'd have four crazy flus every single year and we'd probably all get it in the office. It's, it's a very different environment. But it brings us back to that simple focus on the essentials. It's the basic simple things that have such a huge impact. Washing your hands, you know, keeping your social distance, um, ensuring a much more stringent focus on hygiene. And if you ex expand that to the national level, we've ignored public health care for years. We've ignored public uh, provision of water and sewage services for years. Yeah. And yet this pandemic has reminded us those things matter.
And you know what, you know, Rama, the thing is this pandemic, while it may be a first for many of us and, you know, in our history, in our lifetimes, it won't be the last. And our preparedness will come into question time and time again. We have to do as a continent, as a world, you know, proper scenario planning, proper development of public health facilities so that we are never caught off guard again. Indeed, that's certainly true. And on top of that, that does require a lot of leadership, a lot of forward thinking, a lot of forward planning as well. And that's not something we can offshore farm out and say, yeah, well, in case that happens, we'll sort it out, we'll get some help from somewhere. We've got to do that ourselves. And of course, on that question of leadership, Rama, some would suggest that there is a direct correlation between good leadership and survival rates in this pandemic. Well, on our COVID-19 survivor segment, we now bring you Cape Town teacher Tasneem van Hart, who in June suffered a serious infection of the disease. She says she fears ever contracting the COVID virus ever again and warns that we should all do whatever we can so that we never have to experience the uncertainty, the stigma and isolation that she did when she was struck down by the disease. Rinald Delcom brings us her story. Until a few months ago, grade six teacher Tasneem van Harte was a healthy 33-year-old woman living in Cape Town with her husband. Although she was educating her school kids about the new coronavirus in the classroom, she says she never expected COVID-19 to hit too close to home. When I first heard about COVID-19, uh, I didn't think much about it. I didn't think that it would affect me because I regarded myself as having a strong immune system. I hardly get sick. The last time I had the flu was three years ago. Then in June, at the height of Cape Town's COVID-19 outbreak, she tested positive for the disease. The shortness of breath and I'm not being able to breathe at night, that was the scariest and the body ache. I came to the point of thinking these negative thoughts just ran through my head and I was thinking, am I going to survive the night? Am I going to wake up the next morning? She fought the virus for 14 days as her husband, Kasim Lachadin, nursed her back to health. He hardly slept because every couple of minutes during the night he would get up. We slept in different rooms. So he would, he would get up and he would come and check up on me to see if I'm okay, to see if I'm still breathing. I survived, I got through it, I built up my immune system. I had support of my friends and family and I had many people give me advice and give me household remedies that I can use and drink. Daily I tell my school kids um, to keep their distance to wear their masks when they go out, to sanitize regularly. Even if they go shopping, to sanitize the, the, the products that they come home with. I keep telling, talking to them, I tell them this virus is real. We need to stop being naive and carry on with our lifestyles as if this virus never existed. If I think back, I'm so unsure as to how I got the virus. But one thing she does know for sure, just like doctors and nurses working on the front line of the pandemic, teachers such as herself and countless others in the classroom of 2020 are being stretched to the limit. It's been extremely exhausting, not only for us as the teachers, for the learners as well. And um, we had to adjust and we had to get used to the new normal. And our bodies are so run down that we get sick easily, there are teachers that get sick easily, we pick up germs easily because we are so stressed out. And as she marks these final 2020 exam papers, teacher Van Harte is hoping that her learners will be successful and above all, stay healthy. Renée Dalcom, CGTN, Cape Town, South Africa. Many people from right across the continent have also shared their pandemic warriors through our digital platforms, Lindy. Well, that's right. And we sifted through scores of those stories to bring you some really special ones from different corners of the continent. Take a look. For the last three days, CGT and Africa has brought you unique and compelling stories on some African warriors who exhibited heroism in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
but we also wanted to hear from our digital audience. CGTN Africa's digital media team put out a nomination video requesting digital audiences to share with us their pandemic warriors. We received lots of comments and nominations from across the continent, and from this, three well-deserved individuals were selected. To start us off, our first warrior nominee, a young doctor from Sierra Leone, Dr. Reginald Cole, who was nominated by Thomas Masakwe, who says Dr. Reginald was born and bred in Freetown and was also part of the medics involved in the fight against Ebola and is now also in the forefront in combating COVID-19. Dr. Reginald was staying at the COVID-19 treatment center at the start of the pandemic and was providing medical care for the COVID-19 patients nonstop. One of the challenges we faced in the beginning of the pandemic was misinformation. With the virus spreading fast across continents, record high death rates and cases, fear started to grip through people and misinformation spread at the speed of the virus. Our second nominee, Jama Jack from Gambia, sought to address this issue in her country. Let's take a look at what she had to do. So we developed informative posters that give detailed information on what the coronavirus is, um, what the modes of transmission are, but we also created posters that had simple guides on what people can do to prevent themselves from um, catching the virus. We employed the use of informative videos, uh, producing messages on uh, prevention, producing messages on care, producing messages on the importance of social distancing and we made sure to make these materials available in the key local languages in the Gambia so we had it available in six languages including English and also included sign language interpretation. The pandemic brought yet another dark side, what we would call a silent pandemic, from domestic violence to teenage pregnancies. Here in Kenya, our third nominee, Joy Ogingo, a sexual and reproductive health rights advocate, provided vital information to girls living in the village of Nyakach in Western Kenya. Let's take a look at what Kadin Abundo had to say about her. Joy ran a campaign dubbed Jenga Manzi na Boy Mtani to educate adolescent girls and young women on dangers and consequences of teenage pregnancies in conjunction with ending menstrual poverty. To all our digital audiences who took time to nominate their pandemic warriors and to you who made a difference in the face of a daring pandemic from CGTN Africa's digital desk, we say thank you. Well, 2020 has certainly proven to be a tough journey for Africa and indeed the rest of the world, Rama. Absolutely, Lindy. But the thing with all tough journeys, though, is that it does continue to bring out the true and the selfless warriors among us. This year, if nothing else, has been a firm demonstration of resilience and grit. Absolutely. Well, let's take a moment then to look back on some of the pandemic warriors we've spoken about, those who made a world of difference by touching the lives of others in their fearlessness right in the face of a bold